The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Welcome, everyone, to The Stoa. I'm Greg Thomas, and I'm very happy to um, welcome you to our third of a five-part series, Body and Soul, the Mind of Culture. And first, I'd like to uh, welcome my co-conspirator, I mean, my co-facilitator <laughs> and co-creator of this series, uh, Double G, Dr. Greg Enriquez, and our special guest for this first of a two-parter, double-header today, um, where today we have the one and only Diane Musho Hamilton and Nora Bateson, whom have never actually been in an event together. So I'm just so glad to bring them together for you and for us. And the name of this session is An Ecology of Communication. And this term is a term that Nora Bateson, to whom folks here who are used to the STOA have, you know, you, you know Nora, she's done a series here, um, as has Greg and uh, Diane and the steward of the STOA, Peter Lindbergh, have done a uh, session at, the, um, at Rebel Wisdom on meditation. In fact, I think it was, is meditation sexy? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> so they have never actually been together. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by riffing or improvising on the tune that Nora has laid out. And ecology of communication is a, is a term that I heard her use and I've heard her use on several occasions. The last time was the last part of a series that Jordan Hall was hosting that I had a chance to take part in at the end of 2020, as did Nora. And she mentioned that term in ecology of communication. I said, hmm, let's start there. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start riffing on her tune. So first I'd like to ask Diane to tell us what arises for you when you hear the term an ecology of communication. And then I'd like you to go, Greg, and I'll I'll add in and then we'll bring in the author of the tune. Great. Welcome everybody. It's great to be on this call. Thanks for having me, Greg. It's nice to meet you, Nora. It's good to be with you, Double, Double G and Peter. Thank you, everybody. Um, <clears throat> what I love about ecology of communication is I love the living systems biology reference point and then communication because even in uh, biology, things have shifted to where when we look at ecosystems and we look at plants and we look at forests, we actually are starting to become really interested in the ways in which um, all sentient beings within these ecosystems are part of what binds them into a living system is that they're in, in constant communication. And I think that it's, it's kind of an, an interesting breakthrough in the scientific method because there's a way that our relationship to science, uh, you know, we tend to objectify and, and, and create a lot of distinctions. And so we're learning how these distinctions actually are subsumed in this much greater field of wakefulness, of, of sentience, of giving, of receiving, of all of our well-being being dependent on each other and what it is we're transmitting. What are we saying? What are we expressing and asking for? And how are we how are we just, you know, uh, inextricably related to one another? And so um, I find the, the phrase itself really poetic, uh, extremely apt. And I think it's important that we're looking not just simply at the, these gross realities, but communication is a, a subtle and very profound reality that is, is both uh, we're completely whole and there's distinction. So communication is that, that, dimension of we-ness in which our, our distinctness and our, and our unity is, is expressing itself. So I feel very moved by it and I'm really excited to hear the conversation and it's great to begin with Coltrane because, you know, he just always gets you in the mood. That's right, his classic mm -hmm. version of body and soul, yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Double G, Greg Enriquez, what is it, what yeah. is it that arise in you? 
Thank you, Diane. That's a wonderful segue. Um, I, I too really am struck by the resonance of the term. Um, I actually also happen to be thinking about it over the course of generations. Um, I am. Uh, I was listening to a podcast uh, where Nora was giving a bit of her history of William to William to Gregory, uh, and was thinking about the resonance then of her family across the generations and the communication. She was talking about um, how one of her William grandfathers uh, coined the term genetics and then eugenics took off and how he had an intuitive sense um, to create a broadcast uh, that had a lot of wisdom. Uh, and not just in that moment, but across time. Uh, so I think the idea of ecology of communication in the moment resonating across time uh, is a really, really beautiful thing to reflect on. Um, I know in my own work on the tree of knowledge system, I think about life in terms of information processing within and communication between. I think about mind at the level of animals, information processing, communication within. I think about culture, um, human person culture like we're doing now. Um, and then how do we create resonance uh, between systems? How do we jam and jazz together? Um, and so it's beautiful to be here. Thank you, Greg Thomas, for organizing this. It's a real honor. Uh, and I really think that uh, if we can lean into this and find the right tune uh, to cultivate an ecology of communication well, we can do a lot better than we are doing, at least in many of our socio-ecological systems currently. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Diane. For me, um, ecology, I relate it to culture, which is my main concept. And I do so because of some of the words that have already come up. Diane said, we miss. Um, Greg said cultivation. And when you think about culture in a garden, you think about a garden being cultivated where there's an organic process going on of, of interconnected dynamics where one thing affects the other. And I think of culture in a very, very similar sense. Um, and, and also when I think about the one of the original meanings, the Latin meaning of culture comes from the word cultus, which means care. So an ecology of communications for me has to do with, you know, how can we be with one another in that we-ness, in that intersubjective space with care, concern, compassion, empathy, um, so that we can help each other make it through and, and flourish. So that's what arises for me. How about you, Nora? I think one of the things that's particularly um, apparent right now is that in the ecology of communication that most of us have grown up in, there's an idea that what was said is somehow what's on the script. If you were to have a great transcript of everything that was said, that it would somehow encapsulate that which has or hasn't been communicated. And um, I think this is a huge mistake. It's a, a transcontextual blind spot. Uh, 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 I'm not even sure the blind spot is the right word. It's more just a not, a not, a not perceiving. It's a gap of perception. And so in the ecology of communication, one of the things that I think is so interesting, besides all that you guys have already said, which there's no point in saying again, but yes to all of that, um, there's this, this, this question of what note comes next. And how does that give meaning to the notes that came before? How does it provide possibility for the things that had been communicated before to be had to have new, new uh, reachings? Um, an ecology of communication is is what's in the tone. 
it's 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 in what's in the room what's the context in which this thing is said who are you saying it to and is that communication a gesture and what gestures do you make with me that you wouldn't make with someone else there is an ecology of communication and so often we're looking at communication as something that is like a ping pong game i said and then you said and then they said and then you know it's like this this people putting things in the pot and it getting pinged back and forth but the big question for me is what was it possible to say and that's you know that to me is about what's in the soil right what different things grow in different types of soil to bring it back to the biological notions of ecology what can grow here and how are all of us in some way um tending this soil so you know there are some people who have come into the world fighting coming out of soil that had nothing and they got super fertilized and they you know burst through and they have made it possible for the soil to be nourished for us to not have to be super super fertilized for us to grow in other ways for there to be an ecology that is reaching and touching and tending in multiple contexts simultaneously one of the things about an ecology is that none of the organisms in an ecology is um, going solo. None of them is in just one kind of conversation at a time, right? The earthworm is in conversation with the bacteria in the soil, but also with the trees and also that, tr you know, with the, with the grasses and the insects and the, the people who are going fishing and, and everything else. So there's multiple conversations. What's possible in those multiple conversations? So I want to just continually bring in that um, the ecology of communication is, uh, is a tender space. And a lot of what's happening there is not visible. It's not actually describable. There are not words that will encapsulate it, at least not in this language. Um, so it requires pictures, it requires gestures, it requires breath. You know, in Sweden, there's a word for yes, and that word is means I get ya, I got it. And that's in the ecology of communication. What's it possible to say? Who's it possible for me to be? So. I'll bring bring that in and we take from there. Diane, I feel you wanting to express. You're on mute. I think that that actually more than expressing right now, Greg, is that just the the landscape that you've all created of the ecology, I feel like I'm in the receptivity, I'm in the listening. Oh, okay. um, and that, that receiving side of things, you know, you and I talk about uh, watching great musicians play and everybody's focused on, as, as Nora was saying, on what is it that's being expressed, but what's wonderful is to watch musicians listen. Oh man, it is, yeah. Like, because you can see it and you can feel it, like the receptivity is so, so palpable. So right now, I think I'm receiving what you all said and feeling others listen and just feeling that right now. So I guess when I saw you writing, I was thinking that you may have <laughs> wanted to. But it's interesting. I, I want to share one of the things that that Greg Double G and I talked about. You know, each of us has so much that we can say, but one of the things that we said is that we wanted to serve and be in this space in this session and others where we like the rhythm section in the jazz band and the rhythm section um usually bass drums piano 
they are in a support capacity. They are usually not out front. The soloist, it's usually saxophonist, tr trumpet player, is out front taking a solo. But that solo is never, usually not done by his or herself. It's with accompaniment and it's for an audience. And all of that is part of the ecology also. So that's why the folks who are listening, who are with us right now, who are tuning in, they're as much an important part of this as those of us who are speaking. You know, so yeah, I mean, kind of feeling into this space. And I'll just leave it there and whoever wants to share, continue. The image I had while Nora was talking was this, all of these concentric spheres that you could back up on. And then I zoomed in and saw two people having a compassionate conversation in the way Diane might talk about it. You know? um, and so the ecology of communication. And I also, because as a clinician, I can also see the opposite of that. Right? I can see uh, the broken, bitter, defensive ecologies out of sync that result in hostile, defensive conversations and relations. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe it was a Bronfenbrenner moment, I don't know, but it, it, it seemed to capture uh, a number of different levels and scales. Then what I would like to ask Nora and Diane, taking off from what you just said, Craig, is when you have, when you're in facilitative sessions, when I'm facilitation, that's more, well, that's my experience with Diane. I consider her a grandmaster facilitator of conversations and of creating containers for conversation. Jewel and I, actually went to Canada to study, as I say, at her feet in preparation <laughs> for our business, the Jazz Leadership Project. So I have no qualms about saying that about her. I think she's a grandmaster of this. But what happens in those situations, and Nora, I'd love to hear about this within the context of your warm data labs. Yeah. When you have people who are triggered, who, through whom and for whom shadows arise um, and trauma arises in a group setting. How do you, how do you deal with that? Um, so that a group intelligence, a, a group mind, and, and Diane, I do want you to talk about at some point, big mind. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with those situations where those type of things arise when mm -hmm. um, so it brings a noise in the system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to signal, mm -hmm. um, some, some chaos, some disequilibrium? What, what do you do? So I, I, I love this, uh, just this general way in which we're talking about the, the ecosystem and the all the different dimensions, what's possible, what can be grown there, how can we express our care, you know, for one another, how can these communications be seen, how can we become actually more sensitive so that we can work with the communicative domain because it has so much impact. So if we think right now about a lot of just say the public discourse right now it's very, there's a lot of pain in the public discourse there's pain. There's a, a, you know, a, a deep underlying commitment to competitiveness as a, as a way of being that somehow competitiveness is going to get us to where we want to be. There's, a, there's a, an addiction to excitement. Um, there's an addiction to, to kind of controversy. And so those aren't wrong. They're just, they're just not soothing to the human nervous system. We may get addicted to it, but you know, like a, a drug that's not so good for us, we may be addicted to it, but continuing to take it in is not actually generating health and well-being. So I think one of the challenges is that we have to, so for me, just to answer your question, let me do that first. You know, when I'm, when I'm been given the responsibility to help create a container, 
which I take mm. super seriously. You know, I take it really seriously. If someone asks me to do that, then in a way I become, you might say the guardian of the system. Mm. And that within the system are all kinds of individuals with histories, with agendas, with desires, with, you know, basic human wants and needs. And there's also the quality of what happens in the communication. So when the communication is conflicted, when people are angry or mad or whatever, it's, it's not a wrong communication. And all, and all communication will start to soothe when it's received, you know, so that, that good listening is, from my perspective, as a facilitator or a participant, the number one thing. Because whatever it is that's being, the signal that's being sent out, if I can receive it and honor it, you know, in our integral theory, we say every, everybody has a piece of the truth and every mm. truth is, it's true and partial, you know? And so there's a place for these communications, but if the intention of the group is to work together productively, then I'm gonna take a strong stand that this quality of communication be transformed and that we start to communicate with each other in a way that actually relaxes and soothes our nervous systems. Because when we're threatened, like all other biological entities, most of our energy and, and um, awareness is being taken up by defense. And so when those qualities of, of, of conflict are in the room, most people will be defending and not really have access to either clear thinking or generosity or, you know, it, you know, everybody on this call knows right now, if you're feeling threatened or attacked or that it's very difficult for you to even remember that you like someone. <laughs> if your spouse is giving you a hard time, all of a sudden you feel yourself become defensive. Literally, you don't have the memory to be able to regard them as your ally. Mm -hmm. So we have to take care of that. So intention is really important. What are we doing together? Am I actually here to help with that? If so, then you're going to have to take some guidance. And then how do we listen and then start to transform it so that we can relax, think, and be together and create together in ways that are super positive. So that's a big answer to it. Very no, short that's question. Great. <laughs> The body, nor talks about the soul, the soil, excuse me. Mm -hmm. The body is the, when we do conflict resolution work, the greatest thing people neglect is the actual experience of people's bodies. Amen. Because most of the communication is happening through the body. Mm -hmm. And we're, as, as Nora said, we're focused on the, the objects of language, which in some ways are the tiniest little <laughs> aspect of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So working with the body and helping everybody chill, that's one of the main things. Mm -hmm. Nora, I'd really love to hear your thoughts about that. And, you know, also if we drift warmly into the warm data lab, I'd be mm -hmm. really curious to see how that pings off of what I just said. Yeah, there's a, a lot that fits together and, and some that's sort of slightly different too. So that'll be fun. Um, the, the warm data lab, is, um, is a great example uh, because uh, basically as the a, a host of a warm beta lab, you have absolutely no idea what people are gonna say to each other. <laughs> so it's really wild in that sense. But the structure of the lab is, um, is, is first of all, it's it's based in a lot of theory, which I know you, Double G, would just your all your bells will ring when I list all the theories. But <laughs> but for most people, that doesn't mean very much. Um, so and and it's certainly a process that's created for anyone. So it isn't about um, you know you don't have to know the theory to take part in it at all. But the hosts do. The hosts definitely need to know the theory. And the main reason is that it sort of starts with an acknowledgement of the, the, the larger context and history of communication and understanding of, of functionality or efficiency that, that is in the culture itself, okay? And how difficult it is to actually um, be in ecology when you're doing functionality. Mm. Okay, those two things are not really related to each other. Mm. 
And so there's a, a, you know, you were like, let's talk about warm data. Wow. And one of the things that happens in warm data is that we've made a space where there is a talking about, but the talking about space is created so that the bubbling within has room to bubble and not be actually labeled or named or extracted or harvested or in any way put on you know um, any kind of deliverable program or goal because I actually never know what people are going to get out of it mm. I kind of feel like that's not my business mm. Mm. because when we were talking in the beginning about ecology we were talking in more open expansive terms in more general spaces but in this space what we're dealing with is the fantastic complexity of each person mm -hmm. and each person in relationship to the other people and in relationship to the questions and the way the questions work with the different contexts. So my feeling, Greg, to your question is that it's so context dependent. Mm -hmm. It's so it's about what is happening in the moment there. And I, I really don't have like a, a plan. What I come in with is um, a receptivity to the ecology of communication and a, a, a paying attention to that. But also I have to say that this, this was a surprise to me. Okay, so I'm still learning about how this works to be perfectly honest. I, it works, but I don't really completely know why. Um, and um, the, the way that it's set up is that there are groupings of, it depends, there's, there's the in-person version and the online version. Let's just okay. talk about the online version since we're all inside. So in the online version, each breakout room has three contexts and there's a question. And the question is not about what the problem is. Mm. Because in that space, you're going to get people's really rehearsed scripts that they're already invested in. So we start off to the side. And the question might be, what's being revealed? But then the contexts are history, ecology, I don't know, technology. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you start to tell stories to each other. There's maybe four people in the room. It's... and and. At first, it seems impossible to talk about three contexts at once, mm. but somehow it happens. And then after about 20 minutes, everyone gets moved to different contexts. And you might end up with one in one with four different people. And that one has family and um, let's say spirituality and let's say culture. Mm. Hmm. Okay. And again, you've got these, these, but, but those, for those of you who are theory buffs, the, the contexts are at a similar level, right? There's none of the contexts are love or relationship, right? Because those are not in the about space. So the, the way that the lab is set up is that people are doing multiple contextual conversations. By the time they've gone through three of these, they're actually in nine different contexts at a time, no. speaking in super personal story. So it's very located in the complexity that's in each individual mm -hmm. and the way that those complexities actually make an ecology, which is not verbalized at the top level. Mm. So really what this space, it's almost impossible to actually maintain a polarity through a warm data lab, because mm. with all those different contexts, mm. you just can't do it. I mean, in order to actually keep a polarity in place, you've got to take the context away. Mm. So it's been really fascinating to see how this happens. Um, and like I said, I, I'm learning so much every day mm. from it still because most of all, what I'm finding is that, you know, the limits of what can be said are the limits that we place on each other. Mm. And that those limits are actually produced in relationship. Uh -huh. So 
if they're going to be dealt with, it's not like we're going to say you have to change. Mm. It's more like what it's possible for us to be exploring in relationship together has to change. Mm -hmm. And so that means we need a different kind of acidity to the soil. It needs Mm. to be possible to grow something different. Mm -hmm. That's it's kind of long winded, but I I think Mm. it's important to get a sense of what's happening in that space because it's totally out of control Mm. and there's no way to facilitate all of that it's Mm -hmm. just to host it and somebody said in the chat something like it's a disposition it is absolutely set in the tone Mm -hmm. absolutely set in the tone Mm. this is fascinating because as you alluded to there are some distinctions between your approach with warm data lab and, and Diane's approach. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring you all together. Um, I heard you, Nora, in a conversation with, is it David Snowden? Um, on a, there's a, a series that um, a black woman um, who was a systems oriented leadership person and every year I forget her name sorry she brings Jennifer together Campbell. Jennifer Campbell yes, thank you yeah, yeah. yes so I heard that that session and it was so intriguing because one of the things that she does Jennifer does very well is she summarizes what people say and it's a way for her and I think for the audience to like bring it down to size. And what you and Snowden both said is, "Uh uh-uh, that's not it. (laughs) And I had noticed that because I heard her do that a couple of times. I said, well, she's pretty good at that. Mm. But then when you all said, well, wait a second, it takes out some, some stuff. And it's not just in the words that are being said, as John Verveke might say, it's like, what else is being conveyed? there um so whereas i found i find that diane has beautiful uh expertise in teasing out sameness and difference those polarities you're talking about uh whereas and since i experienced this I'll, I'll just speak on it you know where sameness you know it feels good you know we vibing it's like yeah i know where, where, where we coming from but difference is like this tension there. But in music, the tension is where the juice is and then you get the release, you know? You have thesis and antithesis and you got synthesis. So, um, which our, 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 one of our guests this afternoon uh, uh, talks about uh, quite a bit, Daniel Smoktenberger. So, I, I, I want to pursue some of these distinctions between your approaches or among your approaches uh, because there's some juice there. So Diane, I'm, I'm curious as to what you take from um, or bring to <laughs> what, uh, what Nora said. Well, some of the, let's see, I, the word wild really really stuck out for me, the, the emphasis on having conversations that actually invite an expansiveness of mind, like multiple contexts that in a certain way kind of do away with the simplicity of a polarity because there's a quality of complexity and openness in the system. Um, and I also heard the, the, that they become deeply personal, that the way in which it often evolves, there's a lot of personal that goes on and that there's something intrinsic in the meaning, something intrinsic in, it, I didn't hear Nora say this, but I took this away, that, there, that there's something intrinsic in the way the lab set up and based on these principles that there's a, a quality of, of meaning and value that people receive from participating and that Nora feels like she's learning a lot from doing that. I would say one of the differences that I heard is that I, I'm almost always brought in in the opposite way to solve a problem or to deal with a conflict or to have a conversation about something that's hard to talk about. And then there there does seem to be kind of a specificity to that. And there is an outcome 
that even if it's it hasn't been very well formulated, there's an idea that we need to make things better than they are right now. So I think the intentionality is different. And I, it sounds to me like the context we're working in is somewhat different as well. So I will often work, well, I did a lot of my training as everybody knows in the court systems. Um, and uh, you know the, the dispute resolution forum, which is not a very good one really. Um, and then also I train people to become better facilitators and better mediators. So, um, so I have a lot of curiosity. I mean, love to experience a warm data lab. Me or, too. <laughs> it would be great. It would be fantastic. So I think, I think that there is a difference. I, I feel, I, I guess if I were to confess, you know, it's very difficult. One of the things we know is when we experience a difference, we tend to as ascribe a value uh, to it. So one up, one down, you know, kind of thing. If something's different, there's something better, something's worse. So when I listen to Nora's description, it sounds in a certain way more exciting and kind of interesting than this just, you know, work I do in the trenches <laughs> and Nora, <laughs> with my pick and shovel. <laughs> <laughs> Nora, now this is where, uh, please, you know, aside from what I'm getting ready to offer, please, your response, you know, let it bubble up. But I am so curious as to what, how you describe what arises after a certain amount of time, like after about an hour and a half of this, two hours, there's this field, a collective field that that's what I'm calling it, arises. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, and, and I think it's really important because um, Diane, it's, you know, there's there's trenches all over the place right now. Okay. Like in one <laughs> way or look. another, everybody's in a trench or two at this point. And so I, I really hear you. And and I know that I drive people crazy because the work that we come in and do, they're like, we need to talk about this thing. And it's like, okay, so let's talk about this other thing. <laughs> and and just like we gotta just not hand, don't go direct at it is in the warm data space that's how we are working with it um and i mean it's all there it's all possible it's all good it's just different approaches and different approaches at different times also in, in different moments of maybe um you know inflammation um or acidity or something so the one of the things that happens is that the group each person has a, a kind of um, a, a, a new linking of ideas and memories and impressions through these conversations. New linkings come together. And, and they might, at the end of an hour and a half, start to perceive aspects of themselves, their identity, their lives, their notions about life really differently. Mm. And so what, what we're doing is kind of the pre-step to what you're doing, mm -hmm. where it's like, if you start to perceive the world differently, then how would you approach this issue? Oh, Ooh, that's good. So if there's a perception shift, yeah, that great. Happens, right? So it mm -hmm. might not be about the issue, mm -hmm. but the perception shift that is uh, in encompassing this other thing mm -hmm. shifts the whole ecology. Mm -hmm. And then other things, you know, shift with it. And then mm -hmm. when you sit down to have the conversation, you're no longer in the binary. You're right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And that makes it so, I mean, we should get together because actually it would be great to see what would happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That really, that resonates with me as a, I do a fair amount of couples work. Okay. So mm -hmm. a couple will come in, in the midst of a conversation that has an issue. Um, and very often what you want to do is you want to shift the context. Hey, so how did you meet? <laughs> Tell me what it is that brought you two together, right? And then all of a sudden those different memories, the ecology of that relationship will have a radically different shift. So oh, I've had a different view. Hmm. When you look at anything in an ecology, um, there's a, a kind of an art of perception. And one of the examples I like to use is the earthworm. 
And you can ask, who is that earthworm? Who's the earthworm? What's the earthworm doing? Well, you know, ask the bacteria in the soil, you're gonna get one relationship. Or you ask the tree, it's another, the, the, the grass is right. So we, we've been through this, but now thinking about how that earthworm becomes a description of all these other life, life forms hmm. and their relationships. Hmm. And so when those descriptions shift, everything shifts. Particularly the earth's own description of itself. Right. And when something changes, when a, when a perception changes in one context, mm -hmm. And then when there's another context that sh shifts it again, mm -hmm. it's usually, I've noticed it's usually three. That, that after the third one, you're good. You're wow. out, of the, out of the hole. Wow. Hmm. Interesting. When and then you, can, then you can go ahead and return to whatever the precipitating problem issue is. But the way in which you're relating and perceiving the whole thing has shifted so significantly mm -hmm. that there's space to actually look at it in a new way. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, and a lot of it I think also has to do with this notion of scripts, okay? So when people are doing triple contacts and they're with people they don't know and it's mm -hmm. like, it's wild. I mean, like, mm -hmm. like a field is wild, like a, like a tundra is wild. And you don't know what's gonna grow out of that. And someone says something and you think, wow, I would never have said that or thought about it or <laughs> listened to those words or that tone or, you you know, like, and, and so you get these, these kind of bump ups of your own epistemological limits. Like, why did, why wouldn't I say that? And so there's this way in which you have to respond to that. That's actually not, not your usual way of responding because you've just kind of bumped out of your frame. You're off your scripts. Now you're, you're, you're out of rehearsed land. It's very improvisational. Oh yes. And so it's People start to come up with new words and new phrases and stories. They had no idea. I want to give a quick I, example. Oh, excuse me, Greg, just one second. Yeah, no, of course. One of the, matter of fact, the best-selling jazz recording of all time is Miles Davis's Kind of Blue. And you're talking about some of the greatest jazz musicians on the instrument of all time. And what Miles Davis did, now these, one of the things about jazz is to play jazz in terms of being able to improvise with other people. And I know this by being a, a young alto saxophonist, having a great teacher, Italian gentleman, Cesar DeMora on Staten Island. And you've got a bunch of tunes you gotta learn, you know, in the American songbook, you gotta learn the blues, you gotta learn um, you know, your scales in, in minor keys, major keys, you know, you got to learn how to improvise over diminished chords and augmented chords, all these things together. And so these people, I mean, that's like base level for them. What Miles Davis did, he didn't come in and bring standard tunes that they already knew and probably had certain licks that they learned and played over. He brought in these um, basically sketches. In fact, one of the songs is, is well, one of his famous recordings, Sketches of, of Spain, um, where these are like little shards, chordal shards, modes, and they had to play on the spot he didn't give this them in advance. So you've got John Coltrane and Cannonball Adderley and Wynton Kelly and Bill Evans, Jimmy Cobb on drums, Paul Chambers on bass. And they are creating this in the moment first take where these masters are, are, are creating truly improvisational in the moment creation. And the power of that is one of the reasons I think that recording is, 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 is really so popular because it's so definitive of what jazz is. And that's one of the things I take from what you're saying, Nora, you know, um, that we, we all have these capacities in conversation when we're not 
triggered and, and well, when we are focusing on scripts and our positionalities and this and that, we can talk about some of the things that are just things we might share or have interest in that are not political and such. And then we can get to a space where, I don't know, maybe the, the sameness of difference. <laughs> that's, what, that's what arises for me. We're, we're the same in being different, but that difference, we share that. Mm -hmm. And then we can get to stuff. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm riffing on the spot. I have no idea whether what I just <laughs> said makes sense, but, but, but that's what comes up. Greg, I'm sorry I interrupted you, man. No, all, all I was going to say was I was definitely getting a Taoist flavor. It's like the warm data that could be spoken it's not the warm data. <laughs> and so that, that, that's, that's where I was getting the vibe off of Nora. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I would have to, uh, the, the, um, the comment that you made, Greg, about the tension of difference in jazz is the source of creativity. I think, it, I think that's true with humans too. I just don't think we're used to that because we tend to respond to the sensation of difference in the body because it's just a completely different, you know, stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, it has a whole different feeling. So we tend to move away from it rather than towards it. And I think part of the counterintuitive training, I mean, these are really, really experienced musicians who came to play with Miles. And by the way, Miles Davis's mind and sensibility is in that whole thing and he's requiring a certain kind of thing of everyone. And they're all, they're all oriented towards what it is he's invited them into. And so his mind is also really pervasive in that whole thing. And so Nora's mind must somehow be pervasive in this experience that she's giving others. And I do think that potential for our differences to become a source of creative possibility as opposed to just something we try to get away from. Because conventionally, we don't have any experience of really being able to have differences with each other, like seriously, you know? And yet somehow in this context, they can, just like in an ecosystem, the differences have a place or maybe they don't need to differ in the same way. But anyway, I just wanted to make that comment. And Nora, if Nora's mind is through there, then her father's mind is all up in there too. Ancestral lineage. Her grandfather's up in there too, mm -hmm. right, Nora? And so much more. Mm. Um, so that's, I think, the, the, I think one of the things we really are hoping to pay attention to in the warm data space is that when people show up in a conversation, it's not just them showing up in a conversation. It's all sorts of history and language and the complexity of their experience and, and the, the, the um, it's untrackable huh. to know, you know, what, what makes you perceive the way you perceive. What makes you express your perceptions in the way you're expressing them right now? How, what, what's in that, right? So the information that is bubbling up to the top, it's that iceberg thing, right? It's the teeniest piece of it. But in the undercurrents, there is so much. So really what we're doing is we're creating a space for those undercurrents to shift. And, and that is, um, that's why I can't really say what's happening because if I told you, that would be nonsense. I cannot know, you cannot know, we cannot know. And even if we did know, it would be like trying to describe a dream. What yeah. is guiding you? We don't know. Where did that, where did that solo come from? I don't know, it just came. But it comes, like you said, from generations past and we're carrying the strengths, the weaknesses, the hangups, the traumas, the creativities, the, the abuses, the violence, the care, the tenderness, the humor, the, I mean, we're carrying the culture, we're carrying so much of what came before into this moment that sometimes it feels like there's no way to get out. 
because we're just going to keep perpetuating where we've come from because it's all we know how to do is just keep keep perpetuating it we just how do you be something else than that which you have been brewing to be for s several generations right and and this idea that you can somehow project your will on that and control it i think is is also a, a, a cultural idea um i remember you know when i was a kid my sort of the the thing in our household that really kept it hopping was this this always question of are you perceiving the way you're perceiving or are you perceiving what's there and if you just keep asking that question you start to get at those limits and pay attention to them who can I be? What can I say? And, you know, I mean, does that sound sophisticated? I'm telling you what, I was like three when that question started in. Hmm. So, I mean, and probably it was there from, from before then. But even with little children, we can, we can just open a space that's, that is holding that, that idea that, what we're actually playing with is what it is, the, the way that we're perceiving, because none of us are seeing the actual real thing. Hmm. So what's, what's your perception like? And so those differences are so beautiful. One thing that happens is people come in with an idea of their role. Hmm. They're the father, they're the boss, they're the employee, they're the mother, they're the child, they're the, right? And, and if you, we, like you said, there's some sameness. And for me, that sameness is to be in a shared sense of just the complexity of humanity, mm. the living richness of experience and impossibility of tracking all the contextual processes that make us human. But here we are. For me, that you spoke to a lot that I think really um, allows us to reflect on the ecology uh, of communication, uh, especially going back to some of what Diane was saying. I think it is so hard for people to get perspective on their perceptions and to do so in a way that enables them to both be grounded in what they see based on their slice and at the same time realize the multiplicity of other positions and to figure out how to hold that in relation without chaos and defensiveness and positionality. Uh, to me, this speaks to the sameness difference dialectic. Um, and somehow in our ecology of communication, we're gonna have to figure out a way to hold that difference, sameness, complexity, positionality um, and jazz with it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to do something now that is earlier than we have often done it. It just feels right to bring in uh, folks from the audience to be able to share, reflect, uh, question. But I also, before we do that, because this came back to mind, I'd like, Nora, if you would, I think there's an expression, the aesthetics of inquiry that is yours. Can you riff on that for a second? Yeah. Oh, this is so important to me, Greg. This is like my heart and soul is in this question. And I mean, the thing is, is that inquiry and curiosity is, of course, where, you know, that's, that's, there's so much learning and, and, and ways of being there. But what, what is the tone? Of the inquiry what's the texture what's the rhythm what's the flavor what's the what's the um what's the feeling what's the vibe and so often that sense of inquiry has to do with getting i want to get that and you know we live in a culture that is all about getting extracting achieving acquiring taking and that 
what does inquiry look like when it when it is is mycelial? What does it feel like when that inquiry is is in the humility of ecology itself? And so that's where even you know just if you ever get a chance to listen to some of my dad's lectures, um, there's this tone, and he's he's amused and he's very sad about about you know the damage that's taking place and he's also holding it lightly so it can change it's not that it is like this right the inquiry is not about how to find out how it is that isness is such a tyrannical thing but but to find its living permeable learning peripheries and interfaces. And so the aesthetics of inquiry can be, I need to figure out how to make myself right. They can be, I need to you know, discover this so I can get it. I need to find a solution, a goal, I need to get it. Or they can be more meandering. And uh, that meanderingness is not really welcome in emergency crisis situations. Mm. But the alternatives create so many polarities and, and create consequences that happen and continue to happen in, in folds, in, in multiple orders outside of the situation. So what's the, what's the aesthetic of the inquiry? What does it feel like? What, with what tone are you coming into? Because that will actually produce what it is you're able to perceive and where you go looking, what kind of questions you ask, right? If the question is, how do we measure the impact? Guess what? You're gonna find a way. Hmm. If the question is, how do we, um, figure out the, 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 the sensibilities of this interdependency. That's a very, very different kind of question. And it doesn't leave you at the end with something that you can take home and measure, but it does completely change your interaction with it. Hmm. Right? So if it's systems change you're after, the aesthetic of inquiry really matters. Mm. Diane, if you would, um, because I mean, the, as a facilitator, the questions that are asked, the order that they're asked in, the tone with which they're asked, you know, all has to do with aesthetics of inquiry. And you have such practice with that in mediating and arbitrating situations and also creating those containers. So can you improvise on, on that, that same phrase, if you would? Yeah, the aesthetics of inquiry. That's I like the, that's, that's I like beautiful, that. isn't it? Yeah, what is the vibe? I liked what is the vibe that just really went into me and what is the quality and, and what I, uh, what I also heard Nora say, and I think it's important to me as well, is the sense that her father was amused, right? He was also sad because what he was seeing is in some ways obvious to everybody. We might not agree on many parts of it, but also holding it lightly, that uh, question of feeling into, listening, paying it, and moving with. You know, I think one of the things that is important that I'm imagining is going on all the time is that because communication is, is always relational, I had, a, I had a meditation teacher who said, be yourself, the world will give you feedback, right? So there's always, one's gesture is always creating a response. And so how is it that we receive that response what could also be part of that aesthetic. So being open and holding things lightly and feeling our way and asking what the vibe is and then noticing what impact you know we have? What what happens when one of your musicians goes in a certain way? What's the impact of that move? So, yeah, that's what I came up for me. 
someone just wrote in the chat um, asking about Big Mind, which I alluded to before. So uh, can you very briefly just explain what that is and how it may or may not relate to some of the things we've been talking about? Well, the big mind in that in that way of expressing is really from the Zen tradition, and basically, it's the um, it's the very direct experience that we're not separate, and that uh, you know, mind is a shin in in Chinese and Japanese is uh, really heart mind, and that your heart mind is actually not separate from mine. We're constantly this is what we're talking about. We're we're all in communication. There's a great field of awareness. And that we are not conditioned unless we do some sort of meditative or communicative discipline that takes us out of our independent perceptions. And so big mind is really tuning into the whole. It's really realizing we all have capacities to experience, uh, you know, in a more contracted way and in a more liberated and expansive way. So it's really pointing to that. Mm. Like I can hear my dog scratching on the door wanting in. He's like, I've been out hey. here waiting. This is beyond your usual oh. hour, so let me in. Right. Right. I'll be right there. Okay, no problem. Nora, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, um, when you hear Diane's um, characterization, description um, of big mind, what, what may arise in you in relation to what you do? Yeah, uh, we, we are... Um, you know, first of all, mind, by mind, we don't mean the brain and we don't mean the strictly intellectual capacity. We're talking about the, um, the possibility of lots of organisms to be in interaction, that ecology is mind with a big M. Um, it's, it, it, and there's a, a, a beautiful, piece of theoretical work by my father on um, the criteria of mind. And um, I would say that it's largely misunderstood, but, uh, but beautiful. And there's one piece of it that I always come back to um, because a, a lot of it, I think we could, we could be pretty okay with. We could say, you know, things, in, in mind or in ecology, in life, life we, we kind of use mind and life as exchangeable words, practically. Um, uh, it takes lots of things, aggregates of things being in relationship to produce it, right? All right, you got that. So, and then the next one is like, well, but all those things are in relationship through their differences and their responses. And they're changing, their differences change as they respond. And that's part of what has to happen, right? So you don't get to say everything is fixed because it is not fixed. It's not like a car that has a, a, lots of different parts. Those parts do the same thing every day. In an ecology, that's not how it is. And especially over time. So the differences matter. And then you start to look at how those differences are, 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 are you know, it's really easy to say we're all interconnected, to actually go in and, and swim in, in those interconnections and those interrelational processes and see how they shift each other is a inconvenience. <laughs> <laughs> way For wouldn't. most people's project plan. <laughs> Right, but it's beautiful and it's full of life and it's where the shift actually is. You know, like if you've got musicians and you're coming on stage and they have a history with each other, you're gonna hear that history in their playing together because you are attuned to the nuances of that. Other people might not because they can't perceive those nuances. Right, so, so part of what we're talking about here is the perception of nuanced relational process that we are not taught anything about in life. Mm. And we don't learn about it in school. You're not, you're not given any credit for it. If, you know, if people say, yeah, well, you know, it may be that he didn't say that, but it's what he meant. And that, that doesn't count. That wouldn't hold up in court, right? Mm -hmm. But that's what's real. 
And the little kid is saying, but that's what happened. She made me steal her lollipop. You know, you don't understand, right? <laughs> um, so the question is, when, when there is a something and a, 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 a piece of communication comes in, a piece of information, something comes in, what does it come into? Hmm. It's not just that and nothing more, right? If you say, I love you, it's not just, it's, just, it's not just that. It has everything to do with all of the experiences and the, the language and the, like you're a whole teapot full of differences that have come before. And that one comes in and it lands in that existing stew. And it, it, you know, what's the flavor that it's landing in? What's the tone? What's the vibe? What's the texture? It's not just communication, right? And this is where I feel like it would be so nice if we could just say, look world, you know, everyone, we just have to collaborate and we just got to get through this. <laughs> And the thing is, is that you just can't do that. Mm -hmm. We just can't do that because there is actually a lot of incredible, complex, warm data, indescribable, responsive stuff there. So we have to be careful. You have to pay attention to those nuances. And we, don't, we haven't got the, the, uh, the chops. We don't have the chops to perceive those nuances. Mm. So how, how those are developed is, is kind of what I'm after. Mm. Is, yeah, and, and that I think happens by paying attention to the territory and not the map. Mm. Okay, the map is like, we're gonna fix this, here's the plan. The territory is, okay, but this person is carrying this and this person's carrying that. And mm. they are, you know, when they come together, there's, so there's all sorts of like, you know, a gardener has to pay attention to the relationships. Thank you. The musician Thank you. does. Yes. Well, Peter, uh, yeah. Mm. Can um, can we add, have people come in and to be able to uh, to join the jam session? Mm -hmm. So if you have any uh, questions, start putting them in the chat. Um, I'll take in uh, Laura. Hi, thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, I feel kind of giddy because I, I love these sessions and I love everything that you said. And it's, um, yeah, a real honor and pleasure to hear from you, Diane and Nora. Um, yeah, so I just had this question. When you guys are holding space as facilitators um, and there is a conflict, there is acidity, there's polarization, how do you hold yourselves and engage in such a way that, um, yeah, it's, you're not aloof. It's not that you're impermeable. It's not that you're kind of objectively looking over the situation and kind of determining, but you're also not like vulnerable to the whatever toxic elements or um, acidities arising. How do you, and maybe this is kind of a, a second question as well, but like for me, when I'm experiencing even other people's conflict, I, I do have like notable physical sensations that are quite uncomfortable. And sometimes it takes more energy to work with those than for me to be able to stay present. So yeah, when you're in moments of conflict, how do you hold that appropriately? Well, I would just say in, in the context of my work, you know, something I'm highly aware of and um, is, is, in this case, a big advantage is that usually I have a lot of power and influence, right? So that when people are conflicting, it's much harder to be with a conflict as a participant than as a facilitator, because as a facilitator, I can kind of set the tone for everybody, you know, that we're going to receive this and take it seriously and find out what's true about it. And we're also going to invite another perspective and help everybody soften and, and uh, move through the conflict together so they can have an experience that it doesn't have to be terrible and awful, but actually it's, it's you know, I think about conflict as like oil, you know, it's, it's raw energy. And if it's burned at the right temperature, you know, you can get a lot from it. So for me, uh, it's harder for me to sit in a room when I don't have any power and I can't help with how we work with the conflict because then I just have to deal with my nervous system, you know? So, um, and some of it comes with practice. Uh, I've been through so many conflicts that I kind of know the territory as Nora was talking about. I know how I can help us because I've been through this before. We've 
had these difficult conversations about race or we've dealt with some people feeling betrayed. I was in a mediation um, with a couple of uh, young leaders, two couples actually, whose organization was falling apart because they'd come into some big conflict together. And at a certain point I said to them, you know, we can keep, we can keep telling the story about what everyone did wrong and there's nothing wrong with that. But if we tell the story about what everybody did wrong and how, how I contributed to that, it's gonna change the whole dynamic. So at a certain point, they all shifted into not, not getting rid of all their perceptions of everyone else's errors, but they simply started to include their own. And as soon as they did that, the entire vibe, the vibe, the quality of inquiry shifted. So yeah, that's, that's my response to your question. Just lots of practice and lots of trust that you know how to help people get to the other side. Nora, do you want to respond? Yeah, it's a little it's a little difficult though because I'm not in that direct position. Um, you know, in moments that I have been doing warm data labs with groups that where there's a lot of polarity, um, basically once they start doing the warm data stuff, it it just vaporizes. I don't know what to say. It's not that they're sorting out their problems. It's that they're contextualizing from all these different directions. And then the problem is different. It's just not the same as it was before. And uh, one of the things that often comes out of this is that most of the confusion that developed into the polarity is actually in these underlying spaces. And, and uh, so what you get is a, you know, often that, that conflict is, is, um, is a consequence. That's what it is. It's a consequence, but it's come out of all these complex conditions. And so we don't deal with the, con with, with that conflict. We go into the conditions and we fish around and we just let them fill in. And then that thing is a totally different thing at the end of it. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking about one session I did where I came into a community that was really, I mean, I, I was actually physically afraid when I walked in here to this room and, and they were, you know, screaming at each other and walking out and, and um, it was a community that was just, just betrayed by the government, betrayed by each other, betrayed by the church, betrayed by everybody. The economy, the corporates, the, I mean, you name it, the betrayal was everywhere. And they were just turned against each other completely. And, and it was generations deep, these feuds. And, and I walked into this situation thinking, what am I doing? They're like, I can't bring warm data into this space. This is crazy. And I, but I didn't, I really have any choice. I was just there and I just saw, I just was like, okay, let's just do this. And an hour and a half later, all the things that they thought they were fighting over had shifted. And what they said was, well, what we actually need is the opportunity to build relationship with each other. Because all the things we think we don't have, we don't have because we're trying to get a grant or a, you know, a gift or a, some way to buy it for us, right? We need to be able to take care of each other's kids. We need to take care of each other's elders. We need to you know, help each other fix our houses. We need to, and we need relationship to do that in. And that was exactly what they didn't have to begin with. So what they thought they needed was, you know, an after school program and a this and a that and a this and a that. And so they were competing for these resources and they were cutthroat competitions. This person is always ripping me off and they always get what they want. And this person picks favorites and, you know. Um, so, I mean, I, I, like I said, I'm still learning about this. So I, I, I'm holding this in a very open weave here for you because I don't know how to, um, you know, 
seal it up and tell you what it is. I have actually no idea how that happened because it's, it's, it's in the territory. It was in their stories to each other and the way that that happened. And, and I did dive in. I've just participated and sat down with them and moved through the warm data lab with them um, because I, I didn't, I, I didn't know. And I did, I was like, Di Diane, I was in the exact opposite position. Mm. Uh, I am not the professional. I can't fix this for you, but I'll just be here with you. And so it was a really different thing, but it's so interesting. I mean, I would love to see these things happen together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just one tiny thing. I can't fix it for them either, but I just can, I can help them through some inquiries that will help them readjust. But yeah, I would like to see them together too. I'd love to have, I see a lot of people wondering how they can have an experience of this. It'd be Amen. fantastic. Definitely. All right, uh, next question, Chris D. So my question is for Nora and Diane. How do you two deal with social nexuses? And by that, I mean people who are heavily involved in a conversation and go into lecture mode um, and also trying to get shy people to participate. And how do you make the conversational space equitable with a balance of like top-down leadership and bottom-up insight? Thanks. Do you want to go, Nora? Or would you prefer I do quick first? No, you go. You go ahead. That's fine. Um, so again, I would just I would just say quickly um, by paying attention to everything that you just said. So a simple question related to the extrovert introvert problem, which is in all groups, is for the next thirty minutes. Let's hear from everybody who hasn't spoken yet. Or let's take a minute and let people use a piece of paper and write down what they're thinking so they have a chance to think. I do a lot of structure, lots of small groups, lots of uh, sometimes open dialogue with very light facilitation, sometimes pretty heavy handed. Um, but I think the main thing is just to be aware. Again, for me, the intentionality, what is it we're trying to get to? And then building the right structures and right processes to support what we want the outcomes to be. So my, mine is a little bit more engineered. I do have to say that. I, no, yours is engineered, but with an emphasis on context and, and not knowing. So great. Go ahead, Nora. Um, well, it depends. If it's actual in-person work, um, then I might say something like, Pay attention to the nonverbal communication as an invitation. Uh, that there's a lot of warm data in the nonverbal communication. One thing that I, I this is such a big topic. So I, it's, I'm, I'm leery of opening it up at this moment. Uh, but it's the question of safety. And the thing about safety is that. Uh, a lot of the rules that create safety are really unsafe because they actually limit the capacity and the possibility of uh, people's complexity to emerge. It asks them to stay in a role. Um, so what is safety? And uh, how do we hold a space so that you can show up in your complexity. And and that's again, I think this aesthetics of inquiry question because it's in the tone. It's in the tone of the setup of the space. Um, but it's also about getting out of roles. You know, if you, what, what is your role is so much of the question people come in with. And it's one of the reasons I don't really like to work inside organizations. I'd rather work between them. 
because inside organizations, people turn up in their roles. And how do you get them to, you know, find that seven-year-old self or that, you know, their, their relationship to their microbiome or their, you know, there's, there's so much happening in each human being. And so what I try to do is create a, a container where there's attention to that so much happening in each human being space. But the whole question of safety in a changing world is a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it, requires, uh, it requires much more time than we have to really dive into it. So, but I mean, I, I could, Throw that one back to you, Greg. What's safety when you're playing music? Oh, okay. In your, in your space. Hmm. <laughs> wow, that's a good one. Well, one of the things that I think has been referenced, there's a lot of skill that has to be developed, uh, a lot of chops. Um, and it's not just your ability to, you know, play over chord changes. You can do that in your room. I'm talking about engaging in the moment with other improvising musicians in a way where you're literally negotiating. Um, and this is something what Marcellus loves to talk about how there's a coordination of your own, I'm putting in my words, self with other in a way where it's a negotiating, a, a negotiation. And so when you have that level of skill, there's like an implicit trust that's there. And in fact, there's an invitation not to be unsafe. There's an invitation to experiment, to try stuff, to be vulnerable to know that if I venture out here and I play something wrong, as Herbie Hancock's tell this great anecdote about Miles Davis, he was playing with Miles Davis. And this is in the, six, this is in the 60s, the famous second great Miles Davis quintet. And Miles Davis is playing from what Herbie says, an incredible solo, it was, he was killing. Herbie played the wrong chord. Miles paused. Then what he played next made what was wrong right. Okay. So it's really not a question of safety per se, because they're so beyond Maslow's, you know, security needs. And they're so beyond that that they're up there in the self-actualizing, self-transforming space together which we have to get more people there so we can flourish together. But the foundation of safety is there and that's based on their chops. That's based on their trust that you know these tunes, you know the blues, you got your shit down, you got your shit together. Now let's get together and, and play. Let's get together and swing, you know? So that's what I would say. Yeah. And this is why in the warm data world, we have a, a, a a long a training that's really rigorous uh. hosts. because they the thing you can do is you can meddle and not hold the not hold the conditions so that the ecology can actually happen in the way that you're talking about right because it it and it always starts with a story and that story the host always tells and it's something personal it's something vulnerable and in that there is a, like a tone setting for the conversations that will come out of that. And what they look, you know, people are wondering, what do we do in this space? Who am I here? Who do, what do I do? What am I, what's the right answer? I wanna be, I wanna be good at this, right? I wanna get it right. I wanna be better than anybody else at this, <laughs> even. So that, that tone, like you said, just takes it directly kind of into that, that place of we're, we're wandering in an expansive, very personal, very intimate space together. And how that resonance allows other people into that resonance. And 
And, um, but yeah, I, I, I really, I love that quote. It's my favorite one. It's, there's no wrong notes. Just the oh yeah, Miles, right. Out. There is no wrong. <laughs> another thing Miles there's said, no wrong. another thing that <laughs> Miles had was full of them. Um, I was, I interviewed Wayne Shorter one time, who was a great mind in and of himself, but he talked about how Miles Davis used to say, when they get into philosophical conversations, Miles would say, yeah, play that, play that. Another thing Miles would say is, uh, you know, if you play a wrong note, the next note in either direction, that might be, that'll be the thing to make it right. It's just one note away or or a half note away if, if you're talking about chromatics, you know? So it's a matter of perspective and then flowing in the moment and not looking at it in such a linear way. Well, that's wrong. Mm. What can you do in response? Not just reaction. What can you do in response mm. to deal with whatever that situation is to make it right in that situation for the moment? And that's, I think we're approaching wisdom when we're talking about Peter, can we get another question in? Uh, it's three minutes to the bottom of the hour. Oh, um, really? you... Wow. Wow, that flew by. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see, we only had two. I really want to get at least one more if folks are willing to, to hang a little bit. You good with that, Peter? Yeah, if everyone's okay to stay for a little bit more. Um, Marion uh, Baker had a, a good question that would be uh, that could take on that. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, thank you. This is all rich. I, I chatted back to Peter. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get you in. Like all of, everything, the whole conversation that's already happening is so rich. So thank you. Um, hmm. So I'm a leadership development geek mostly with business leaders. Um, one of my main clients is a family business. Mm -hmm. um, and skipping a bunch of stuff. And I'm in an intimate relationship where, you know, even though we could say like I coach and teach, right? Like my inner five-year-old gets triggered and like, <laughs> right? Human, all of that. So it's like constant learning lab. Oh, I made up, a, I'm also an acronym nut. So I made up a, a, an acronym for lab today for listening, allowing best. Nice. nice. Um, okay, so my question was, and you know, we could take a year, or the rest of our lives to answer this, was what, what would you wanna say, Diane, Nora, whoever, um, about like the vertical development first in each human being in order to have the soil space horizontal communication? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Can I just quickly say that on the ground, real life, when we're talking about the territory, not the map, you know, whether we're talking about Keegan or, you know, ego development, I mean, there's so many different models, skills-based and this and that. The vertical and the horizontal is always going on at the same time, interspersing, intersecting various lines of development. And I mean, that's just the reality of it. It's all going on at the same time. It's not an either or, you know, and um, vertical development is, is very important, but horizontal development is, is, is as important. You know, I mean, if you put it in a va very basic way, you know, if you can get your cognitive, you can get this head, if you can get the heart, and if you can get that gut, which was also alluded to <laughs> earlier, uh -huh. then you then you you go on somewhere. If you can get those coordinated, your head, your heart, and your gut, and what you what you say and, and what you think and what you do in relation to your higher purpose, and what I'm hoping in our conversation this afternoon with Zach Stein, we'll talk about you know, insolment, mm. I think you're going, to, you're going to, a, a long way. So that's what I would say. Diane, you want to? Um, I would, I would say that, that uh, the only thing I would add is just simply that I think we get focused on um, a little bit on development and we don't attend enough to 
uh, the part of us that doesn't want to change mm. and the part of us that when we have changed, we've lost a lot. Mm. You know, that there's a grief always with our development in the sense that we're, we're losing reference points and uh, change. All, I mean, that kind of growth always involves some kind of grief. So I think it's about picking up that which is in the background a little bit more around it and helping people see the part of themselves that is not interested in it. And maybe there's a preserving function there that's worthwhile. And also yeah. what are the emotions associated to growth that are actually difficult? Yeah. So that comes up for me just as things to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on all of that, yes. And, and I guess also just to, watching out again for the culture that is constantly saying development is good there is a progression you're on a linear track to a more refined version of yourself and you know that there's something um very goal oriented about that that creates a linear perception inside it and and i think again it's that get i need to get this i need to become this i got to get to the next level it's like this thing is in our culture everywhere. And it's not how a meadow works. Hmm. There is an ecological issue in the concept here. And um, so one question for me around this that I work with is more around whatever the situation is or the person or the family or the whatever it is to ask how is it learning to be in its world? In what way is the, 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 the tree that's growing in the forest that's crooked? In what way is that crookedness perfect expression of the conditions and the contexts in which that tree is learning to become? And so then when you're talking about development, it's not the tree that needs to develop, Right, it's just, it's all over. It's the, it's, do you want that tree to be perfectly straight? Well, is that the right thing? Like what's, what's in the contextual relational learning, the mutual learning of all these conditions that come together? How is the tree learning to be in its world with all the other organisms that it's there with? How are they learning to be in relationship to the tree? Because so often we wanna change one piece of an ecology without any recognition whatsoever of the ways in which all the other people or organizations or institutions or organisms around that person or that family or that whatever are, are, are pressing, are producing relationships that keep it in the shape that it's in. Right? So, you know, the, the, the family is, is always a really good example, but so often people, you know, you go, you meet someone's family and you see how they are with their family and it's not at all how they are mm. when they're with you or when they're with their friends or they're at work or they're doing something else. And, but in those relationships, they're in a particular shape. So, for me, that's the question. How, how is this person or this, this living system learning to be in its world? And that's a transcontextual question, right? It's never, about, it's never about the tree, actually. It's about the way in which the tree's contortions are an expression of relationship to context. Yeah, thank you. I hear a lot of curiosity and compassion being poured into that question. And a shift of focus yeah. into yeah. the relationships, off of the thing yeah. and into the relationship. Right, right. Yeah. right. Environment. yeah. Sometimes I call it like the seeker achiever paradigm of like trying to be the best, trying to be the <laughs> cutest tree um, as opposed to, yeah. Okay, thank how, how you. About being, how about being, your best yeah at yeah, your particular stage of development at this particular time until you get to 
the next phase, once you go through whatever transitions and transformations you go through, yeah. it's like, it's like when they're playing golf together, yeah, they're keeping score, but in golf, you are being your best in the moment. Mm. And if you can be your best in the moment and it happens to be better than the other golfers who are playing in that moment, cool. But the point is you are playing the course, mm. not against other people per se. Mm. All right. Okay, wow. I think, I think, I think that's a good place if, uh, if I may, to um, bring this to a close, if would, would Diane, Nora, and, and Greg, would you have any um, final things you would like to share? Well, you were quoting Miles, and I, I just kept thinking about Wynton Marsalis and that thing he has said about jazz. What he learned from jazz is everything's fucked up and everything's cool. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I just like to share that at the end. Okay. <laughs> and it was a pleasure. It was so great to get to know you, Nora. Thank you so much, you guys, for for hosting us. I've really, I really appreciated both the uh, came in, in the ecology of communication, uh, the aesthetics of inquiry. What beautiful terms! And I really appreciate uh, what you guys brought, the notes that you brought, uh, and what we are weave able to weave together here. It certainly warmed my heart uh, and mm -hmm. and opened my mind and hopefully vertically and horizontally allow me to connect in the systems that I'm in uh, with a little bit more resonance and harmony. Nora? I just want to say thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to meet you, Diane and Double G and Greg. It's just always great to connect with you. Um, so I, I have, you know, about six more big conversations I'd love to have with each of you right now. And right. that's, that's- Well, perfect. all we got to do is make it happen. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's we'll do that. Time. All right. I, I would love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you everybody for hanging in with us too. It's really great group here. Thank exactly, you. which is exactly what I was gonna say. So I think with that note, we are going to depart and uh, I'll hand it over to Peter in case he wants to say anything, but certainly I'll say thank you, Nora. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Greg. Enrique has double G. And we invite everyone back uh, this afternoon. This is a double header, 5.30 to seven. My goodness, we've got um, Zach Stein and Daniel Smachtenberger. One conversation, I'm gonna say this, one conversation I wanna see is Daniel and Nora, remember, no, let me see. Daniel gave the closing um, keynote address at the Rebel Wisdom Festival. And it was me and one or two other people with Daniel at the very end. And I was thinking about the vibe that Daniel brings with that, with that polymathic perspective. And I thought about him in relation to you with all of that heart and soul. Mm. I want to see that together. <laughs> so we're going to make, we tried to make it happen this time. We didn't, right. but we're going to make it happen. Definitely. Beautiful. So thanks to everybody. Thank you so much. Hope to see you later. Thank and, you, Greg. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for your